Shalom. This is the third video on our study on the reincarnation of David, King of Israel, as a future monarch of the whole world and the Messiah. I would advise you before looking up this tape that you look up the two previous tapes to get the general information that we have already given you. If after having looked at the free videos, you will have been given the instruments that set you free from all forms of idolatry and put you on the way of your Creator to do what He wants and no longer to be fooled by the lies that have been given to the nations of the world throughout the years. In the last video, I promised that I would explain to you how God would bring back the 12 tribes of the children of Israel that left Egypt, but that perished in the wilderness. God had given a promise. He had given a promise to these people that he would bring them to the land of Israel. He didn't do it. They all perished in the wilderness. And we have seen in the previous tape that after 40 years, the Almighty forgave these people their sins. But they died in the wilderness and they did not make it to the Holy Land except those that were younger than 20 years of age and two of the spies who went into the land of Canaan and brought back a favorable report. These were Caleb ben Yefuni and Joshua ben Nun. So we continue with our study. The prophet Hosea says, in the name of his Creator, and he's talking to the children of Israel. Return, O Israel, return unto Hashem, your God, for you have stumbled in your iniquity. According to the prophet Hosea in chapter 14, the verse 2. And then it is stated, For a small moment have I forsaken you, and with great mercies will I gather you. With a little wrath did I hide my countenance from you, and with everlasting kindnesses will I have compassion upon you, says your Redeemer Hashem. This according to the prophet Isaiah in chapter 54, the verse 7. And then it is stated, and this is very important that we take note of this, it says, as in the days of your coming out of the land of Egypt will I show him marvelous things. The nations shall see and be put to shame for all their might. They shall place their hands upon their mouths, according to the book of Micha, in chapter 7, the verses 15 and 16. And then the prophet Jeremiah says in chapter 31, Israel returned to the land of promise. And he states in the name of his Creator, Thus says Hashem, The people that are left from the sword have found favor in the wilderness. Even Israel, when I go to cause him to rest from afar, Hashem appeared to me. Yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with affection have I known you. I will again build you. And you shall be built, O virgin of Israel. Again you shall be adorned with your tabrets, and you shall go forth in dance of them that make merry. Again you shall plant vineyards upon the mountains of Samaria. The planters shall plant and have use of the harvest, for there shall be a day that the watchman shall call upon the mountains of Ephraim. Arise, all of you, and let us go to Zion, unto Hashem our God. For thus says Hashem, 
Sing with gladness, O Jacob, says Hashem, save your people, the remnant of Israel. Behold, I bring them back from the north country, and will gather them from the outermost parts of the earth, and with them the blind and the lame, the woman with child, and she that is in labor. To give over a child, a great company, they shall return to the land. They shall come with weeping and with supplications. I will lead them. I will cause them to walk by rivers of water in a straight way in which they will not stumble. For I have become a father unto Israel, and Ephraim is my firstborn. Hear the word of Hashem, O you nation, and declare it unto the isles afar off, and say, He that scattered Israel, does gather them, and keeps them as a shepherd gathers his flock. For Hashem has ransomed Jacob, and he has redeemed him from the hand of him that is stronger than him. And they shall come and sing in the heights of Zion, and they shall flow to Hashem's goodness, to the corn, the wine, and to the oil, and to the young flock, and the herd. For they shall be as a watered garden, and they shall not pine any more. Then shall the virgin rejoice and dance, the young men and the old together. We see that it is stated that when Hashem brings back his people, he brings back the blind and the lame, the people that can't walk. He brings them back. My wife has been in bed for 35 years. She can't walk. She can do nothing. She's completely paralyzed. And she lived in the Ukraine. And yet, Hashem has brought her from the Ukraine to Jerusalem. So part of that prophecy has been fulfilled where it says that the lame will skip like the young deer. Hashem is going to heal the blind and the lame and the sick when the Messiah returns to the land of Israel. For I will turn their mourning into joy and will comfort them and make them rejoice from their sorrow. And I will satiate the soul of the priest with fatness, for my people shall be satisfied with my goodness, says Hashem. A voice is heard in Ramah, lamentations and bitter weeping. Rachel, she is weeping for her children because they are not. They're dispersed amongst the nations of the earth. They're not in Israel. They're dispersed amongst all the nations of the earth. And Rachel is weeping because of this. And so Hashem goes and comforts her and he says, Refrain from weeping and your eyes from tears, for your work will be rewarded, says Hashem. For your children, they shall come back from the lands of their enemy. <laughs> this is very interesting. You know, amongst the nations, we believe that the Goyim amongst the nations are our friends. The Bible says, be very careful. Behind your back, they are plotting to destroy you. And I'm giving you the proof of this. In the second Psalm, study it, read it. It's all explained there. In secret, they are plotting to wipe us off the face of the earth. And then in the Psalm 83 also. So don't believe that when you are living amongst the nations, that you're living amongst people that are friendly to you. Yes, when you talk to them, they may look to be very friendly. But the truth, and it's Hashem that's saying it, it's not me. They are your enemy and they are plotting to kill you. And we've seen it in Germany in the Second World War. And then it is stated, and there is hope for your future, says Hashem, and your children, they shall return to their borders. Each of the tribes of Israel had its own portion in the land of Canaan. There were 12 tribes, there were 12 portions, and each one had his own portion. There were two and a half tribes that did not live in Israel. They lived in what is now called Jordan. And this has to be liberated from foreign occupation, 
for the children of Israel to return to their borders. And this is going to happen in the very, very near future. This, according to the book of Jeremiah, in chapter 31, the verse 1 on to 16. We have seen that the breaches which were made in the house of David are to be fully restored, which means that the land of Israel has to be fully purged of all foreign occupation. We see at present that the Palestinians claim that the land of Israel belongs to them. It is theirs. And the Jews, they are the ones that are occupying our land. This is the greatest lie that has ever been invented and it is upheld by the nations of the world. And in doing so, in upholding this lie, the nations of the world, the leaders, they are fighting against their Creator. Because their Creator says that He is bringing back His children to the land of Israel, and they are the ones that are going to occupy it. The Palestinians have to go, the Christians have to go, the Vatican has to go, the land has to be completely purged and made ready for the children of Israel to return to the land of their forefathers. The nations are upholding this lie, and there seems to be no solution to it. But Hashem Himself is going to fight our battles as in the days of old. Remember when I opened this tape that I told you, when I came to the text that says, as in the days of your going forth out of the land of Egypt, so will I show great favors to the children of Israel. We see how Hashem made great miracles when we came out of the land of Egypt, how He sent the plagues upon the Egyptian to release us from their bondage, how in the wilderness He provided for us and destroyed our enemies, even in the days of Joshua when the land was being purged of foreign occupation to give to the children of Israel. The same is going to happen in the very, very near future. Now I am quoting from the book of Leviticus in chapter 26, the verses 42 on to 43. When the time finally arrives that their stubborn heart is humbled, speaking of Israel, I will forgive their sin. I will remember my covenant with Jacob, covenant which he made with Jacob, that he would give to his descendants the land of Israel. I will remember my covenant with Isaac, the same covenant which was repeated. And I will remember my covenant with Abraham. And I remember the land. For thousands of years, the land of Israel has lain desolate. There was no rain. It's not like another nation where you can irrigate the land. The land of Israel depends upon rain and nothing else. If there is no rain, there is no food. And it says here, I remember the land. When he remembered these three covenants which he made with the elders of Israel, it says he will remember the land that has been laying waste for thousands of years. It has to be healed through the rains that are going to descend. I remember when I came to Israel about 30 years ago. The fruits, they were beautiful, but there was no flavor in them. The eggs, there was no flavor in the eggs. Everything had to be restored. And it's only being restored gradually as the children of Israel return to the land. The more they come, the more blessings are poured out upon the land. And now we have fruits that are delicious, but it's still not 100%. But when Israel will be finally established, we will have the most beautiful fruits in the world. But when the time fully arrives that their stubborn heart is humbled, I will forgive their sin. 
I remember my covenant with Jacob was also my covenant with Isaac, my covenant with Abraham, and also remember the land, for the land will have been left behind by them and will have enjoyed the Sabbath when it laid in desolation without them. The sin they had committed by denerating my laws and growing tired of my decrees will have been expiated, both even when they are the land of their enemies, again, the land of their enemies. I will not grow so disgusted with them, not so tired of them, that I would destroy them and break my covenant with them. Note what is stated. You people that say that there is a new covenant, that the old covenant, what you call the old covenant, is broken. It says here, this is a big lie. I will not break my covenant with them. That covenant is in power, even to the end of times. Since I am God, their Lord, I will therefore remember my covenant with the original ancestors, whom I brought out of the land of Egypt and the sight of the nations, so as to be their God. I am God, the land that God gave to Israel. It's a very special land. There's a big secret here, and I'm going to reveal it to you. Of this we read in the book of Genesis, this chapter 1, and verse 14. God said, There shall be lights in the heavenly sky, to divide between day and night. They shall serve as omens. Look what it says. They shall serve as omens and define festivals. They shall serve as omens and define festivals. Days and years. Every seven day is a Sabbath. Every seven years is a sabbatical year. Every 50 years is a year of Jubilee. And they shall define Days and years, according to the book of Leviticus, chapter 23 and 25. Read it. I'm not going to quote from it because otherwise the tape will be too long. They shall be lights in the heavenly sky to shine on the earth. It happened. God thus made the two large lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He also made the stars. God placed them in the heavenly sky to shine on the earth, to rule day and night, and to divide between light and dawn. God saw that it was good. It was evening and it was morning, the fourth day. What do we learn from this? The fourth day. Man had not as yet been created. Man was created on the sixth day. Yet God had in his mind to create a nation of holy people who would keep his festivals, his days, and his years. Every seventh day is a Sabbath. Every seventh year is a year of a sabbatical year. Every fifth year is a day of jubilee when everything is set free. So we see even before man was created, God had this in his mind. We see that finally when God did create man, that ten generations later, man had become so degenerated that the whole world was filled with violence. <laughs> when we look at the world today, I can say the same thing. The whole world is filled with violence. You open your television, you hear about bombings that have been made, killed that have been killed. You're not safe anymore. In Hebron, a young girl was sleeping in her bed and an Arab came and killed her in her bed. You're not safe anymore. You don't know today if you get up in the morning that you'll be there in the evening. There's no guarantee. So we see that God had to destroy the generation of Noah, and he told Noah to make of an ark, and he and his family were saved. Now, eventually when Noah left the ark, the Almighty made a covenant with him and with his offspring. This is very important that we understand. 
what has been going on in the world ever since the days of Noah. The world has been filled with idolatry, with lies. God made a covenant with Noah and with all of his descendants. You are under that covenant which God made with Noah and none other. Don't believe in the New Testament, it doesn't exist as far as God is concerned. But the covenant that he made with Noah does consist. And the covenant is the same covenant that he made with Adam and his offspring and consists of six commandments which he gave to Adam. The first commandment, and you're under this commandment, to believe in one God. The second commandment, to honor God and not to blaspheme. The third one, not to murder. The fourth, not to steal. The fifth, not to commit adultery. The sixth, to set up courts of justice. This is the covenant that God made with Adam and which was renewed with Noah when he left the ark. But to Noah, he gave an additional commandment, which was that Noah and his offspring was allowed to eat meat of animals on condition that he slaughtered them. God said to Noah and to his sons with him, I myself am making a covenant with you and with your offspring after you. All the offspring that came after Noah and his three sons, they are under this covenant. It will include also every living creature that is with you, among birds, the livestock, and all the beasts of the earth with you. All that left the ark, including every animal on the earth, I will make my covenant with you, and all life will never be cut short by the waters of the flood. I opened my computer this morning and looked at the news. And I saw that in Texas, there was a great flood, great catastrophe. Lots of people had to get out of their house. I saw cars, just the roof of the cars, on the water. God says he would never again bring a worldwide flood. But a local flood, yes. And why does it come? It comes because the people reject God and don't want to have anything to do with him. They live in idolatry. If they would walk in the ways of Hashem, this wouldn't happen. And it's been happening all over the world, in Japan, in America, in Germany, in England, all over the world. It's happening. And our religious leaders, they remain silent. They don't know. They're blind, completely blind. And they cannot direct the people on the right path. But here it is, it's written in the Bible. God made a covenant that he would never again destroy the world with a worldwide flood. We know why the flood came upon the world, because of the wickedness of the nations. The world was filled with violence. And the world is filled with violence today. So we continue. There will never again be a flood to destroy the earth. God said, this is the sign that I am providing for the covenant between me and you and every living creature with you for everlasting generations. Look what it says. For everlasting generations. There's no end to it. And it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth, the rainbow will be seen among the clouds. I will then recall the covenant that existed between me, you, and every living soul in all flesh. The rainbow will be in the clouds, and I will see it, and recall the everlasting covenant between God and every living soul in all flesh that is on the earth. 
this is the covenant which you are under. You're not under the New Testament covenant. The New Testament covenant doesn't exist as far as God is concerned. But this covenant does exist and you are under it. Have you believe it or you reject it? But it's your problem. This is the sign of the covenant that I have made between me and all flesh on the earth, according to the book of Genesis, chapter 9, the verse 8 on to 17. Ten generations after the great flood, the people again rebelled against their Creator. As it is stated in the book of Genesis, in chapter 11, the verses 1 on to 9, and I'm quoting, The entire world was of one language, with uniform words. When the people migrated from the east, they found a valley in the land of Shinar, and they settled there. They said to each other, Come, let us mold bricks to use as stone and asphalt for mortar. They said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top shall reach to the sky. Let us make ourselves a name so that we will not be scattered over all the face of the earth. God descended to see the city and the tower that the sons of men had built. God said, They are a people single, all having one language, and this is the first thing they do. Now nothing they plan to do will be for them. Come, let us descend and confuse their speech, so that one person will not understand another speech. From that place God scattered them over all the face of the earth, and they stopped building the city. God named it Babel because this was the place where God confused the world's language. It was from this place that God dispersed humanity over all of the earth. Concerning this event, it is written in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 32, the verse 8. When the Most High gave the nations their heritage and split the sons of man, he set the borders of the nations to parallel the number of Israel's descendants, 70. But his own nation remained God's portion. Jacob was the lot of his heritage. In plain words, the land of Canaan is God's heritage. In the Psalm 94, the verse 14, it is stated, Indeed, the Lord has chosen Zion, he desired it for his dwelling place. For God has chosen Jacob for himself, Israel as his beloved treasure. Indeed, the Lord will not abandon his people, nor will he forsake his heritage. We see that in the beginning, I have explained that when God made the sun and the moon, that he had in his mind to build a nation which would keep his festivals. And here we see, even before Jacob is born, even before Abraham is born, that God takes part of the world, the land of Canaan, and he says, this is my heritage. This is for my children Israel, whom I will create. This is my heritage. And it is stated that God will never forsake his heritage. And we have seen it for thousands of years, the land of Israel lay desolate. There was no rain. So God never forsook his heritage, never gave it over to another nation. And he certainly won't give it over to the Palestinians. In the book of Deuteronomy, in chapter 10, the verses 10 on to 12, the land which you are about to occupy is not like Egypt, the place that you left, where you could plant your seed and irrigate it by yourselves, just like a vegetable garden. But the land you are going to occupy is a land of mountains and valleys, which can be irrigated only by the rain. It is therefore a land constantly under God's scrutiny. The eyes of God, your Lord, are on it at all times, from the beginning of the year until the end of the year. We see that God knows everything that's going on in this land. His eyes are upon it from the beginning of the year to the end of the year. And it is stated that land of Israel does not tolerate sin. Therefore, it is stated in uh, Leviticus chapter 18, verse 27, The people who lived in the land before you 
did all disgusting perversion, and they defiled the land. But you shall not cause the land to vomit you out, when you defile the land as it vomited out the nations that was before you. Concerning Israel, his prophet Isaiah, speaking in the name of the Almighty, says, I am Hashem. I have called you to serve the cause of right. I have appointed you as a covenant of the people and a light of the nations. Isaiah chapter 42, the verses 6 unto 7. Then in Isaiah it is stated, Because I am putting water in the wilderness to give my chosen people drink, the people I have chosen, I have formed for myself, will sing my praises. When Israel became corrupt, God made the land to vomit them out. They were scattered amongst all the nations of the earth. But God's promise is that he will gather them and bring them back to the land of Israel. In the book of Leviticus, chapter 26, verses 41. But when the time finally comes, when their stubborn heart is humbled, I will forgive their sin. I remember my covenant with Jacob, as also my covenant with Isaac, as also my covenant with Abraham, and I will remember the land, for the land will have been left behind by them, and will have enjoyed its Sabbaths, which lay in desolation without them. The sin they had committed by degenerating my laws, growing tired of my degrees, will also have been expiated. But even when they are on the land of their enemies, I will not grow so disgusted with them, nor so tired of them, that I would destroy them and break my covenant with their original ancestors, whom I brought out of the land of Egypt in the sight of the nations. Thus to be a god to them. I am God. In Deuteronomy chapter 30, the verse 1 and 7, There amongst the nations, God will have banished you. You will reflect on the situation. You will then return to God your Lord, and you will obey Him, doing everything that I am commanding you today. You and your children will respect with all your heart and with all your soul. God will bring back your remnant and have mercy on you. God your Lord will once again gather you from all the nations where He gathered you. Even if you dispersed will be at the furthest parts of the heavens, God your Lord will gather you from there and he'll bring you back. God your Lord will bring you to the land that your ancestors occupied and you will occupy it. The children of Israel will occupy the land, not the Palestinians. God will be good to you and make you flourish even more than your ancestors. God will remove the barriers from your hearts and the hearts of your descendants so that you will love God with all your heart, with all your soul. Thus, you will survive. God will then direct all these curses against your enemies and against your foes who pursued you. The Archangel Gabriel, addressing Daniel, says, At that time, Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands for the children of your people. And there is to be a time of trouble such as has never been since there was a nation, even to that time. However, at the time, your people are to be delivered, every one that will be inscribed in the book. And many that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to life everlasting, others to everlasting reproach and abhorrence. Daniel chapter 12, the verse 1 unto 2. Note, that it says that there's going to be a resurrection, but it doesn't include everyone. It says some will be raised up to everlasting life and some to everlasting abhorrence and reproach. We see that in the time of the second temple, the priests abandoned the worship of Hashem and they told the people idolatry. And because they have done this, when they are resurrected to life, they are resurrected to everlasting reproach and abhorrence. 
they will not have the status that they had before they died. They are to be lowered in status, as it is stated. The result of all this is that the resurrected priests will be degraded in their status in the Messianic Temple. They are no longer allowed to offer up sacrifice. They are to attend to the people and to do manual tasks in the Messianic Temple. These priests are resurrected for everlasting abhorrence and reproach. Abhorrence and reproach because in ages in the past they led the people astray, forsaking God and leading the people into idolatry of the nations. The prophet Isaiah states concerning the resurrection of the dead. Your dead shall live, my dead body shall arise awake, and they shall sing. All you who lie in the dust and the earth shall bring to life the shades. Isaiah chapter 20 and verse 19. You have seen it when the Archangel Michael will stand up to deliver Israel, that this is to be a time of trouble for Israel. Church was never once since there was a nation. Israel became a nation on May 14, 1948. Now note what the prophet Isaiah says immediately after he has spoken of the resurrection of the dead. He says, Come, my people, enter into your chambers, bolt your doors, hide yourself for a little moment, or till the indignation be passed over. According to the book of Isaiah, chapter 20, the verse 20, we see the archangel Michael states that at the time of the resurrection, there is to be a time of great trouble for Israel. However, Michael assures Israel that they will deliver it from this great trouble. We see the prophet Josiah admonishing the people to go into their chambers, to lock the doors and to wait until all this evil has passed over. When the Almighty redeemed Israel out of the house of bondage, he promised Moses that he would bring Israel to a land flowing with milk and honey as it is stated in Exodus chapter 3, the verse 8. And the Almighty said, I have seen the miserable state of my people in Egypt. I have heard their cry to free them from their oppressors. Yes, I am well aware of all their suffering, and I mean to deliver them out of the hands of the Egyptians and to bring them out of that land to a land rich, broad, a land flowing with milk and honey. The land of the Canaanites, the Hephites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hevites, and the Jebusites. See, the book of Exodus in chapter 3, the verses 16 and 17, as also the book 13, the verse 5, and 33, the verse 3. However, now for Moses, the reign of the males of that generation which left Egypt, made it to the promised land, all except two males of that generation, that left Egypt of 20 years and older, perished in the wilderness, according to Numbers chapter 14, verse 14. Only two males of that generation made it to the Promised Land, and they were the two spies, Caleb ben Yifune and Joshua ben Nun, who, after spying out the land of Canaan, brought back a favorable report to Moses. All the other males above the age of 20 of that generation perished in the wilderness, even Moses and his brother Aaron, the high priest of the nation. So the question arises, did God fail to keep his promise to his people? The Torah states, God is not human that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should draw back. Is it his way to say and not to do, to speak and to not fulfill? According to Numbers chapter 23, the verse 19. The whole of that male generation above the age of 20 that died in the wilderness died as an atonement for their sins. The word of the Almighty states that they are to be resurrected. They are to be given a second chance and to repent of the folly of their rebellion. 
if they do indeed repent, then the Almighty will bring them back into the promised land. As it is stated in Numbers Rabba, chapter 19, the verse 6, Moses had to die with the generation which he took out of the land of Egypt so that he might lead them again in the future. So the question arises, where in the Bible do we find the information of the resurrection of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel that left Egypt and that perished in the wilderness? The answer to this question is found by the prophet Ezekiel in chapter 37. Here we have the report of Ezekiel's vision as he was transported in a vision thousands of years into the future to witness the resurrection of the dead of the whole house of Israel who left Egypt under Moses and who perished in the wilderness. The prophet states, The hand of Hashem was upon me, and Hashem carried me out in a spirit, and he set me down in the midst of a valley. The valley was full of bones. He caused me to pass round about them, and behold, there were very many in the open valley, and behold, they were very dry. Ezekiel chapter 37, the verses 1 unto 2. So the question arises, which valley was this? This chapter of Ezekiel's vision deals with the whole house of Israel whose bones are scattered to the four directions of the wind. In this valley, so to include the whole house of Israel, this valley must also include the burial place of Miriam, Aaron and Moses, the servant of the Most High. Moses was the last of those who were doomed to die and who were not allowed to go to the Promised Land. When Moses passed away, it is stated, there in the land of Moab, Moses, the servant of the Most High, died, as had been decreed by the Most High. He buried him in the valley of the land of Moab. This according to Deuteronomy chapter 34. Before Moses did pass away, he gave a review of all that had taken place as he had led the children of Israel for forty years. Moses held his discourse in the valley beyond the valley. Moses held his discourse in the valley beyond the Jordan, in the valley over Bet Peur, in the land of Sihon, the king of the Amorites, who dwelt in Hezbon. Deuteronomy chapter four, the verses forty five unto forty eight. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, you know it. Then he said to me, Prophesy of these bones, and say to them, O you dry bones, hear the word of Hashem. Thus says Hashem to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live, and he will lay sinews upon you, and then I will bring flesh upon you, and will cover you with skin, and blow into you, and you shall live, and you shall know that I am Hashem. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a noise. And behold, a commotion, as the bones came together, bone to bone. And as I beheld this, I saw sinews upon the bones. And then flesh came upon them, and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, Prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, Thus says Hashem, Come from the winds, O breath, and breathe into these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath came into them, and they lived, and they stood upon their feet, an exceedingly great host. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel, the twelve tribes of Israel, not just one tribe. Behold what they say, our bones are dried up, and our hope is lost, for we are utterly cut off. Ezekiel chapter 37, verses 3 up to 12. In this vision, the prophet was witnessing the resurrection of all of the adult mates above the age of 20 that left Egypt, the house of bondage, with Moses leading them. Time and again they had rebelled against their creator and against his servant Moses. And finally, when they listened to the report of the 
returning spies and again rebelled against their creator by refusing to go to the Holy Land, they were sentenced, all of them, to perish in the wilderness, to be slain by the hand of God. Of the adult generation that left Egypt, only Caleb ben Yefune and Joshua ben Nun made it to the Promised Land. These two spies have brought a favorable report. When the rebels heard the divine decree pronounced against them, namely that they were all to die in the wilderness, they thought now that they had been thus been sentenced to die in the wilderness and not inherit the promised land, they thought that all hope for them was gone. They now believed that they were utterly cut off from their people. But God, in his infinite mercy, forgives them and accepts their death and their atonement, as the prophet Ezekiel states. Therefore, prophesy and tell them, says Hashem, Behold, I open your graves, and I cause you to rise from your graves, O my people, and you will bring you into the land of Israel. Note that the resurrection takes place outside of the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am Hashem when I have opened your graves and will have caused you to rise out of your graves, O my people. I will place my spirit in you and you shall live and I will bring you into your own land and you shall know that I, Hashem, have spoken and have performed it. When Moses had this encounter with God at the burning bush, the Almighty gave him instruction and told him to go to the children of Israel and tell the children of Israel that he was going to liberate them from the Egyptian bondage and he was going to bring them to a land flowing with milk and honey. And we see that Israel left Egypt and in the wilderness Hashem didn't keep his promise. The whole of that generation that left Egypt under Moses perished in the wilderness except Caleb ben Yefune and Joshua ben Nun. All of them died in the wilderness. But, as we have seen in the book of Numbers, chapter 14, it is stated that after 40 years of dying in the wilderness, the Almighty informed that generation that their sin had been forgiven. But, we have seen that they were not brought into the land of Israel. Now, we have been explaining the vision of the prophet Ezekiel as he is taken thousands of years into the future and he is set down in the valley of dry bones. And he is commanded to speak to these dry bones and to bring them back to life. And uh, this happens in the valley where Moses held his last discord. And we see that the whole of this generation that left Egypt under Moses, that perished in the wilderness, is now being resurrected. And this is being resurrected because the Almighty now is going to keep his promise, which he made to the children of Israel, that he will bring them to the land flowing with milk and honey. So I'm quoting from the book of Ezekiel, and Hashem says that he will bring Israel back into its own land, which means that the land doesn't belong to the Palestinians. It belongs to the children of Israel. And we will see as we continue with this tape how the wrath of God will be poured out upon the Palestinians, completely annihilating him. It will be finished with them. They will no longer exist. So I advise the Palestinian people, while they still have the occasion to leave the land and to return to the Palestinian lands, occupied by the, by the Arabs, that they will be saved. But if they remain in the land, they're asking trouble. So, in the Valley of Dry Bones, and with the resurrection 
of these dry bones back to life, we see that the Almighty is fulfilling his promise that he made to Moses and to the children of Israel that he is going to bring the 12 tribes that left Egypt under Moses and that perished in the wilderness, he is going to bring them into the land of Israel. Now we see that if Israel would have walked into the ways of Hashem, there would never have been a need for them to perish in the wilderness and to be resurrected from the dead and then to be brought back to the land of Israel. They would have come back to Israel in the days of Moses and the Messiah would have appeared and the world would have known a very better time as we know now. A time of wars, pestilences, sicknesses, you name it. This world that we live in is like a hell. Every day when you turn on the television or you turn on the radio or you read the newspapers, you have nothing but bad news. When the resurrection finally has taken place and the rebels have been eliminated from the 12 tribes, then they will go up to the land of Israel singing songs of joy, as it is stated. I'm quoting from the book of Isaiah, chapter 51, the verse 11. And the redeemed of Hashem shall return. They shall come with singing unto Zion, and everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain gladness and joy, for sorrow and sighing shall flee away. I am he who comfort you. <laughs> this is going to be a very great experience, believe me. As it is stated by the prophet Zechariah, all the sages of past ages, all these righteous people of past ages, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Zechariah, Samuel, the prophet, all these righteous people, will come back with these people that have been resurrected from the dead, as it is stated by the prophet Zechariah, and I'm quoting, And Hashem shall come, and all the holy ones with you. Note what it says, and all the holy ones with you. Jerusalem is going to be the center, the capital city of the universe. For Hashem is going to make his habitation here in Jerusalem. And from Jerusalem will go out the laws all over the universe. And all peoples and nations will give honor and respect to the king that will be set up in Israel, David the Messiah. We see that from the very beginning, when the Almighty chose Israel as a holy nation, he told them, you shall be holy, for I am holy. You shall be a holy nation, for I have called you to instruct the nations of the world with my truth. This is Israel's mission. And we see that when finally the resurrected of the people come to Zion that it is stated, and I am quoting from Jeremiah chapter 50, the verse 20. In those days and at that time you will look for Israel's iniquity, but it will not be found. For the sins of Judah, but you will not find them. For I will pardon the remnant that I leave this implies that all the wicked are going to be slaughtered. All wickedness is going to be put away. No longer exists. And this is confirmed by the prophet Malachi. The day that is coming is going to burn them up, says 
Hashem, leave it on neither root nor branch. But you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness will shine with healing rays. You will leap like cows going to the pasture. You will trample upon the wicked who will be like ashes under your feet. On the day that I am preparing, says Hashem. Now, having returned to the Holy Land and having been purified of all wickedness and sin, the psalmist, in the name of the Almighty, admonishes the people, saying, I will hear what the Almighty will speak. He will speak unto his people, to his holy ones. But let them not return back to folly. Surely his salvation is near for them that fear him, and his glory made well in the land. Mercy and truth have met together, and righteousness and peace have kissed each other. The truth now springs out of the earth, and righteousness has looked down from heaven. Yes, Hashem will give that which is good, and our land shall yield its produce. As we have said previously concerning the Palestinians, we have seen that Israel is God's heritage, and he's never going to forsake his heritage and give it over to some other nations. We have seen for 2,000 years there was no rain in the land. Hashem didn't want the land to blossom for the other nations. It was a desolation. Hashem kept it for his people when they returned to the land to occupy it. But ever since the establishment of the Jewish nation, we have seen that the Palestinians have claimed that Israel, the land of Canaan, is theirs, and that we, the Jews, are occupying their land. This is one of the greatest lies that have been invented by the Palestinians and that is being upheld by the nations of the earth. As we see in the second psalm, what it says, that the nations of the world are plotting in secret against Hashem Elokeinu and against his anointed. His anointed is the Messiah. They don't want the Messiah. They don't want the kingdom of heaven to be established here upon earth. They want to continue as they do, and they want to eliminate Israel from off the face of the earth. But Hashem states through the prophet Isaiah in chapter 11, the verse 13, And all they that harass you shall be utterly cut off. End of the quote. We see that Hashem says, all they that harass you, and the Palestinians in the first place, because they slaughter our children, and they murder our people on buses, on the streets, they stab them, they run them down with their cars, they go into their houses and they slaughter them. All they that harass you will be utterly cut off. They will no longer exist. It's finished. The nations are trying to impose upon Israel a two-state solution. And we have seen that some Israeli prime ministers go along with them. Prime Minister Barak, Prime Minister Olmert, and even Netanyahu accepts a two-state solution. But what do we see? All these years, all these years, all the efforts that have been made by the politicians, by the American presidents, the European kings, the European politicians, and here in Israel, everything has failed. Nothing has been accomplished. Right up to the day, nothing has been accomplished. And it says, I'm quoting from the book of Isaiah in chapter 29, 
verse 6 on to 7. There shall be a visitation from the Lord of hosts with thunder and with earthquake and a great noise, with whirlwind and tempest and the flame of a devouring fire and the multitude of all the nations that war against Israel, even all that war against her, and the bulwarks about her, and they that distress her, shall be as a dream, as a vision of the night. The nations have vanished from this land. The Lord has annulled the counsel of the nations. He has foiled the seams of the people. Many are the faults of the people, many are the faults of men. But it is the counsel of the Most High that stands forever, the thoughts of his heart that stand forever throughout all generations. And through the prophet Isaiah in chapter 26, verse 10, Let favor be shown to the wicked, yet they will not learn righteousness. In the land of the uprightness will the wicked deal wrongfully. He will not behold the majesty of Hashem, the wicked, they will not behold the majesty of Hashem in Lokeni when he brings back his people to the land. They won't, they won't see what is happening. As is stated, let favor be shown to the wicked, yet they will not learn righteousness. In the land of uprightness will the wicked deal wrongfully. He will not behold the majesty of Hashem. Lord, your hand was lifted up Yet they see it not. They shall see with shame your zeal for your people. Yes, fire shall devour your adversaries. You see, that there is no hope for a two-state solution. The Palestinians will be banished out of the land by Hashem Elokeinu. So we see that the politicians, the American presidents, the prime ministers of Israel, in fact, are fighting against the will of their creator. And they are doomed to lose. We see that it is stated immediately after the resurrection of the dead in the wilderness, and I'm quoting from Isaiah's Chapter 20, the verse 20. Come, my people Israel, enter into your chambers, lock your doors, hide yourselves for a little moment until the indignation be passed over. We see that the indignation takes place in Israel. And the people are admonished, as in the days of your coming out of Israel, to lock your doors, go inside, don't go outside, for outside is going to be destruction. There's going to be pestilence, there's going to be wars, there's going to be death over the whole of the area. All those who have harassed you will be perished out of the land. In the book of Proverbs, chapter 3, the verse 25, it is written, do not fear the sudden terror, nor the destruction of the wicked when it comes. Isaiah chapter 8, the verse 10. Conspire a scheme, but it will be foiled. Conspire a plot, but it will not materialize, for God is with us. You will not fear the terror of the night. Note what it says. At night, there is going to be terror. Maybe rockets will fall. I don't know what kind of terror there will be. But it says at night there's going to be terror and the Israelites are admonished to go into their homes and to lock their doors. Nor the arrow that flies by days. These are the bullets that will be fired from machine guns and from pistols and from rifles. The pestilence that prowls in the darkness at night. We see terror at night. And we see here that uh, 
Torah says that there's going to be a pestilence. It's going to eliminate all the enemies of Israel. Know the destruction that ravages at noon. A thousand may fall at your side, and ten thousand at your right, but to you it shall not come. You need only look with your eyes, and you will see the retribution of the wicked has as his heritage the land of Israel and the children of Israel. And he's not going to give that up to the Palestinians or to the nations of the world. With this, we end this discord for now. And if it is Hashem's will, we will continue with other lessons in the future. But everything is in the hands of Hashem and we rely only upon Him. Thank you for listening and thank you for being with us. We would like to hear your comments. We look forward to your comments. They are very, very important to us. You may distribute these videos in any language that you seem fit. The only request that I make of you is that you do not add and you do not diminish. Again, thank you for looking and we look forward to seeing you in the future. Thank you very much.